momentarily. Buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a comenzar en un momento. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the White Stadium Jamaica Plain Transportation Workshop. My name is Dion Irish. I'm Chief of Operations for the City of Boston and a lifelong resident of Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester. I will be your facilitator for tonight's meeting. Tonight, we will learn more about the transportation plan for the Jamaica Plain neighborhood. The goal of this meeting is to gather feedback on the current plan to ensure that it minimizes impact on the community who lives around Franklin Park. We are joined today by various city staff members, including members of the community engagement team, the mayor's office, Boston Transportation Department, Boston Unity Soccer Partners, and their transportation consultant, Brian Bizell from Howard Stein Hudson. And we're also joined at this point by our state representative, Montano, and also um, city councilor uh, Weber. And we'll give them an opportunity later on uh, to say hello. Next slide, please. Before we get started or go any further, we are providing translations for today's meetings in three languages, Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Cape Verdean Creole. To get the translation set up, go to the horizontal bar at the bottom of your screen click on the globe icon that says interpretation, then click on the language you'd like to hear. You will then have access to this meeting in that language. Next slide. So just wanna go over some ground rules for tonight's conversation. For all participants, um, let's maintain respect for each other's in this space. Let's use I statements. Uh, if you're representing a group or a neighborhood association, Please share that with us. This is a public meeting for the purpose to discuss the transportation plan for Jamaica Plain. So we will prioritize the Jamaica Plain um, resident voices for comments. And we'll ask that you keep your comments and questions solely to the transportation plan. We'll also be using a timer to limit each, co each comment to two minutes so that we can make sure everyone has an opportunity to be heard and, um, if there's extra time, then we can go back to folks and we'll also endeavor to answer as many questions as we can uh, live in the chat. So step up and step back. As project managers, we will collect and review your feedback from the questions and from the discussions and from the polls. We will answer as many questions in the chat as we can. And if your comments are not addressed during the discussion, please feel free to reach out to us at White Stadium at boston.gov, one word, white stadium at boston.gov. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, tonight's meeting will focus on the transportation. The agenda for the meeting is to quickly touch on high level project overview and propose BPS and community benefits, or discuss our transportation planning approach, also discuss proposed multimodal approach for NWSL game days, and also to apply this plan to real life scenarios. And then we'll open the floor for our discussion. Throughout tonight's meeting, we'll be incorporating sections for folks to provide live feedback and ask questions. Next slide. All right, everyone. So we're gonna try out Slido today. Um, you'll see this also later on. Um, but to get everyone acquainted with it, um, today we're talking about transportation for JP. So here you can scan the QR code. It'll take you right to slido.com and you um, will input that number. There's no need to put a space. Uh, it's 2255359. Uh, so the question you see on the screen is, uh, what transportation topics do you want to see covered today? Um, so again, just to kick us off, let's hear what's on your mind. Uh, we'll cover many of these today, but just want to give you a moment to get acquainted with, with Slido and um, to get a little bit of feedback here on what you're expecting tonight. And I see, yep, I, awesome. I see the responses coming in. All right, so biking, pedestrian paths, yep, we'll be covering that. 
Uh, parking issues, I assume you're talking about existing ones. So yes, there's an opportunity to address that. Um, traffic signals, that's right. Parking permits, we'll definitely talk on that. How will you get to the stadium? Yep, then we'll talk about many different routes. Bike lanes, awesome. Thank you so much for sending your suggestions in here. Um, how many buses and shuttles? Great. All right, so we'll keep this open so you can keep on, on sending in um, these topics here, but um, you'll see this later on again. Um, so I'll pass it back to Chief here, thank you. Thanks, Anshi. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna talk quickly about the project and the proposed benefits of this partnership and what it will provide for Boston public students and community. And uh, I know this question will inevitably come up. We will be talking more about the design and, and um, different um, benefits for BPS at later on design meetings, but tonight we're really gonna focus on, on transportation. Next slide, please. So from this slide, you can see um, visually that White Stadium has been a topic of conversation regarding needed investments for, for decades. Um, I actually played high school sports there as well, and I was one of those voices who um, always felt like we needed to invest more into White Stadium. As you can see, from in 1970 to 1990 to as recently as 2015, there's been many attempts to invest and renovate and make White Stadium the gem that it was when it was first constructed. And uh, unfortunately, um, those efforts have failed and the um, condition, the state, stadium is now in a worse condition than it was when I was in high school. So despite multiple attempts, there's never been this, the right combination until now of funding partnership and public benefits to proceed. Next slide, please. This proposed project at White Stadium is going to deliver tremendous benefit for the city of Boston, most importantly for our BPS students, for our community, for Franklin Park. This slide highlights just a few of the key benefits that this project will provide for community. For instance, thanks to having a private partnership, we can invest a significant amount of resources into this facility to deliver high quality amenities and programs that will be very challenging for us to provide on our own. These amenities include new indoor and outdoor amenities, including high quality grass field, a 400 meter track that meets state regulations, an athletic hub with amenities that also serve the public. This partnership not only makes these upfront investments, but it also provides a sustainable means of maintain, maintaining and preserving this investment. This project additionally will provide space for numerous economic benefits for local residents, businesses, some of the major economic benefits include new construction jobs, support for women-owned and minority-owned businesses, opportunities uh, for local businesses, as I mentioned before, a $500,000 annual community benefit fund. And we also believe that White Stadium, the investment there will be a, would catalyze other implementations of the Franklin Park Action Plan Additionally, the amenities and operational plans created due to stadium renovation will also help support other large events that currently take place at Franklin Park with no solidified transportation plan. For example, the transportation plan will be able to put in place for large events, such as the half marathon, um, mitigating the impact on the community. So again, I think this transportation plan that we will develop with your feedback will serve as a blueprint for all like large events at Franklin Park. I will stop here and turn it over to my colleague, Archie. Not before I go on doing one more slide. Um, this slide is just a sample of what a, an August schedule could look like, um, showing you in, in brown the, um, the BPS activities that typically would happen in August. Also in pink, you'll see some of the events that we typically have for the community, the uh, Puerto Rican Festival, Kitty's Carnival, Special Olympics. Um, in blue, we also see the summer camp activities that happen there. And I think most importantly that I wanted to Ill illustrate visually is in the green, you'll see those are the, the times when the Unity Soccer uh, partner, tenant, however you want to refer to them, would be 
also using DS Stadium. And as you can see, it's less than 10% of all the available hours. So I will stop there and turn it over to Anshi. Awesome. Thank you, Chief. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anshi Moreno. I'm from um, the mayor's policy team, and I'm also um, a lifelong Roxbury resident. I'm so excited to be here with you. I see some familiar uh, names here. So thank you for following us along this journey. We've been having meetings since July. So I'm, I'm very grateful to get your feedback along the way. Uh, so uh, Chief talked about the, the the scheduling process and a little bit of the benefits and overview. We'll definitely dive deeper into that at future meetings. We'll share the dates at the end. But today we really want to hone in on the transportation plans. Um, so we want to share with you all how we got to uh, the current iteration of the plan. So here go. So um, where do we start? So there was an RFP that asked for a preliminary transportation plan um, that was provided um, back in July. And also we had a, uh, a transportation meetings in September and October. So this um, had some multimodal components already to it, but um, we got some great feedback um, and are incorporating that into the plan you'll see today. Um, and we have been working together with uh, Boston Union Soccer and our, and our city departments to refine it. And the question that we've uh, been approaching is, how do we best mitigate traffic congestion for NWSL soccer game days to serve both residents and visitors and improve transportation challenges exist of, of existing large events at White Stadium? So today you'll see a plan for uh, game days, but that is meant to be applied to other large events and then to be customized for um, medium and small events as, as it best fits. Um, so what did we do? We looked at uh, the tools that you'll see at the bottom of the screen here in blue. So first off, um, the public feedback we've gotten, we've looked through the chats, you'll see FAQs online at um, boston.gov slash white, white stadium. You can see the recordings there, but that was really helpful to see what worked and what wouldn't work for residents. Then we looked at the Franklin Park action plan. Um, there's already great guidelines there. That's a very, it's an award-winning plan and we really wanna utilize it and make sure that we can implement some of the stuff there. Um, I know the plan mentioned that there wasn't a lot of, um, there was a lack of implementation tools. So we're hoping to bring in those resources here to be able to, to tackle some of those um, in the short term and long term. Third, we have um, the ability with this proposal to look at all of the surrounding areas and what other transportation issues are going on. Um, so you may have heard about Columbus Ave or Blue Hill Ave. I'll have um, Xavier and Maya from BTD are here with us today. They're project managers on those projects. Um, they'll share their contact info in the chat. Um, we won't be talking in depth about those projects, but we are aware that it may feel like there's a lot going on. And so this has given us an opportunity for all of our city departments to meet um, more consistently and to understand how we're communicating out so that it makes sense to you all as we go through this process and can fit in some of the initiatives there to complement a transportation plan here and for the park in general. So that has been a really great part of our approach. Um, fourth, uh, we looked at an in-depth traffic management and analysis. Um, fifth, we have a review of city enforcement tools that we can apply. So we looked at what's at our disposal as a city. Um, and lastly, you'll see here, um, we have new staff commitments and new investments from both the city and the soccer team. So for example, um, you may have heard at State of the City, there's a new Parks Franklin Park administrator um, um, and um, other maintenance staff that will be um, part of this, um, the mayor's investment in Franklin Park. Um, and Boston Youth Soccer will also have a community engagement director and some other staff commitments that we'll talk about throughout um, the presentation. Um, so be before I move on, um, we just wanna thank uh, Franklin Park Coalition and Livable Streets and all of you for the feedback focused on these, all the different approaches and ways that you can get to White Stadium. Um, it's been really crucial to have your support and to really problem solve what would make a comprehensive, accessible and responsive uh, plan. So I just wanna take a moment to say this wouldn't be possible without your engagement there. Um, so once we looked at all the tools and, and spoke to you all, uh, we came up with these uh, transportation goals. Again, this is right now we're focused on game days, but it'll be applied to other large events. So if you see something missing or if you're not sure it's included here, um, type it in the chat. We'd love to hear it. Uh, so one, we have improved pedestrian safety, accessibility, and wayfinding at the park. 
Two, make it easy for neighborhood residents and park visitors to get around. Three, encourage use of sustainable transportation choices. Four, ensure efficient traffic management during large events. And five, use new and existing tools to protect parking and mobility in the surrounding neighborhoods, especially during big events. Um, and at, throughout the engagement process, we've we've heard about and and we've all uh, as local residents have visited some of um, the events that we all love at Franklin Park um, from festivals. We have Bamfest here. There are graduations. Um, there's um, Kitty Carnival and the Puerto Rican Festival. So. These, you can see the number of spectators last year. Uh, BAMS Fest had uh, 15,000 people there, um, which is awesome. But we want to make sure that we're addressing some of the uh, uh, logistical concerns. Uh, so again, these are events that are already happening, and we want to provide um, uh, some blueprints so that we can solve uh, some ongoing issues here. So with that, this is an overview of the approach that we took. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Brian. Um, and Commissioner Gove here to talk through where we are in this multimodal plan for JP. Hi there, everyone. Good evening. Brian Bizel from Howard Sign Hudson. I am the transportation consultant for Boston Unity uh, Soccer Partners. Um, I'm working very closely with them and City of Boston. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. So when we talk about a transportation plan, we have to talk about the different modes of travel, right? And that's what we see for this project. That's what we see on the on the screen now. So there's five different modes. There's, there's public transportation, whether that be for you know Jamaica Plain, the Orange Line, and the extensive buses that run in the area. Um, a big component of this project is that there is no spectator parking on site. And anyone that wants to drive, which we'll get into more detail later, for those that are just starting this process, um, there will be remote parking facilities that will then have uh, shuttle buses getting people to the stadium itself. Um, we are not encouraging rideshare, but we know people are going to use it. So we need to be prepared and be accommodated, uh, ready to accommodate it. So we can, we'll get into details on that. And then obviously biking and walking the, you know, the best, most green um, way to, way to travel, but not feasible for everyone. But um, you know, still something we're going to encourage as many people as possible to do. So all of the calculations and numbers that you'll see um, that we've done are based on, on these five modes. And the percentages that we use were 40% um, taking public transportation, 40% of the people parking off site and then being shuttled in, 10% um, using ride share, and then 5% biking and walking. And we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into more details, but it's important to note that we're estimating 5% biking, um, but we're actually providing enough bike parking on site for 10% of the spectators to to, to bike to the uh, stadium. Um, and we'll show you where that will be and how that operate in, in a bit. Sorry, uh, folks, give me a second here. Our first technical glitch in three meetings. <laughs> All right, there we go. So this is an overall plan, right? We, like I said, we've we've had meetings with Jamaica, uh, with Roxbury and Dorchester, and now Jamaica Plain. So this is a map showing all of the extensive bus routes that are in the area. Um, obviously, for Jamaica Plain, really the the big the big driver of, of, of public transportation is is the Orange Line on on the left side of this graphic. Um, and we'll get into more specifics for Jamaica Plain now. This is just an overall picture of looking at, you know, the, this is site isn't a transit desert. There is actually a lot of transit in the area, including the heavy rail of the Orange Line. Next slide, please. Um, this is a graphic that shows uh, the walk from Green Street. Again, we're going to be encouraging people to use public transportation. We'll get into the shuttles that will be running from certain stops, but we really feel a large percentage of people that take public transportation will actually just walk from Green Street or Stony Brook. Um, which are both about uh, 0.7 miles from the stadium. Um, so that's shown on the left. And then on the right is uh, actually a comparison of um, Gillette Stadium with the New England Patriots. And some of the parking lots are are a good bit in, and 0.7 miles from the stadium itself, right? So people going to events like this are used to and fully aware and, and willing to walk from from you know this distance from the green line to, to White Stadium. So it's not unusual. And, you know, I would say that the walk from Green Street to, to the White Stadium is much more pleasant than the walk through the expansive parking lots of, of Gillette Stadium. So 
it's certainly something that people do and and we expect that they'll do it here next slide please so this is a graphic showing connections, um, pedestrian and bicycle connections, right? After we've we've encouraged people to take public transportation, how do we then get them from the orange line, in this case, to the stadium? Um, and what this graphic is showing is the, the walking routes um, that are expected for um, for the area, right again, from Stony Brook to and, and Green Street. And then also, and I'm gonna hand this off to William Moose from BTD after this, the green line shows where BTD is in the process of doing bike infrastructure improvements, which William can talk to more detail about. Great, thanks, Brian. You want me to take over there? Yes, please. I'll just also note there was an update on that last slide uh, about um, the reconstruction of School Street between Washington and Walnut, which is slated for this year. Um, so that's a repaving project. Um, and also all the pedestrian ramps on that section of School Street are going to be rebuilt this year. Um, Switching gears to uh, to speed humps, um, just wanted to provide an update on the city's uh, new speed hump program, relatively new, um, that we're calling the safety surge. So um, as part of this, we're now just sort of uh, programmatically installing speed humps um, on neighborhood streets across the city um, on a zone-based approach. And, um, and essentially what you'll see here on this map is all these streets that are in pink here um, to the west and sort of northwest of the park um, are all slated for um, for speed hump installation um, this year. Um, so that means that uh, essentially all of the streets in this area, with the exception of sort of your major roadways like Columbus Ave and Wal um, Washington, um, will be uh, will be receiving speed humps. You'll also note that, um, some of the streets like Sigourney Street and Walnut Ave um, are also on here and will be getting um, speed humps, which uh, you know, we think these are going to be a great benefit. Um, to residents you know, every day of the year, um, but also for game days when we have uh, a lot of folks walking um, from uh, the Orange Line stations that are nearby. Um, I'll just also highlight that the black lines on here show uh, streets that have already received speed humps and the blue are streets that would be eligible in future phases, um, so beyond 2026. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'll also uh, give a little plug about the, uh, the Eggleston Square Redesign. This is a project that um, that I've been working on um, now for several years, um, and it, all the sort of area that you see around this sort of dotted line um, is in the uh, the project scope. Um, and so this project includes a lot of elements, um, including you know, in addition to those um, speed humps that are going to be installed uh, this year. We have other traffic calming and accessibility improvements planned, uh, particularly for a lot of the important pedestrian corridors. Um, through the neighborhood between Southwest Corridor and Franklin Park. So that means, um, you know, Boylston Street um, and School Street in particular, a lot of those, uh, those streets will be getting things like uh, raised crosswalks as well um, and some curb extensions. Um, the project also includes safety improvements at, um, at some other important kind of secondary intersections that people might uh, cross to, uh, to uh, get to the Franklin Park. So we're talking about intersections like uh, Amory Street at Boylston, Amory Street at School Street, Amory Street um, at Atherton Street um, are all getting safety improvements as well. Um, the project also um, will include, as Brian alluded to, um, an improved bike connection between the Southwest Corridor and Franklin Park. Um, now we are adding traffic calming and speed humps that will make a lot of these streets much more comfortable to bike on, but we're sort of thinking about the primary um, route for people who are trying to uh, sort of move across the neighborhood and get between the Southwest Corridor and Franklin Park um, as this combination that you see outlined here of Atherton, uh, Copley Street, and School Street. Um, so we would basically be accom accomplishing this by using a combination of sort of uh, traffic calmed shared streets for people biking in one direction and uh, contraflow bike lanes um, in the other direction. Um, and finally, I'll just also mention that um, that there are um, also a lot of uh, improvements planned for um, the intersection of Walnut and School specifically, which we think is going to be a major kind of gateway um, into the park, um, you know, all the time and for games. And so that will include um, things like curb extensions to make the pedestrian crossings shorter and safer, um, and also a, a raised intersection. So the plan currently is to table the entire intersection, bring it up to sidewalk level. Um, to slow vehicles um, as they as they approach that crossing. Um, so 
that's a little bit of a look at what we're doing um, on the uh, on the neighborhood sort of safety uh, front from, for transportation. Um, I'm happy to uh, put a link to this project um, in the chat and also my contact information if you want to follow up with more info on it. And I think with that, I'll pass it back to Brian. Yeah, hey there. So I've seen there's a couple of comments on on, on bikes and, and blue bikes and you know more internal to the site, and that's you know what we talk about here. So the graphic shows there's you know a multitude of different paths and whether walking or biking paths within Franklin Park. Um, and specifically for for the event days, we we're going to have uh, bike parking, as I said, for up to ten percent of the spectators, which would be about a thousand bikes. Um, and this includes private bike valet, which is shown on the two blue squares or rectangles um, where someone can drop off their bike and have it stored in a secured location and then they can pick it up themselves after the event. And then we're also there is a blue bike station uh, just inside the park along Walnut Ave north of the stadium, but we're going to implement blue bike valet. And what that is, is an attendant that will um, keep the dock, whether it's before the game, when, when the station starts filling up, right? If it's a 19 dock bike station, as soon as 19 people came, essentially that'd be the end of being able to use blue bikes. But what the valet does is take the bikes out of the dock so that another person can come in and keep using the station as if it was a much larger station. And we can do that without actually putting in a large station that would be unsightly in, in Franklin Park for when there wasn't events. And then likewise, as, as the event ends, you know, the station won't just be the 19 bikes that are there. As, as the station gets emptied out, the valet will be there and they will stick in new bikes and then more people can come and take a bike. So it really gives you a lot more flexibility and we can rely on blue bikes for a bigger percentage of the people that are uh, going to be visiting the events. So, um, you know, it's a big part of our transportation plan and, and um, you know, we, we're hoping to encourage, we're going to encourage and, and hope as many people bike as, as possible. Next slide, please. Um, you know, it, it's great saying everyone, you know, we're going to encourage people to take public transportation and bike and walk, but, you know, we all know that some certain people are, are going to want to drive and certain people might have to drive. Um, there will be no parking on site, as I said, and when we get into the uh, presentation further, we'll discuss uh, protecting the streets around the park as well. Um, but as for the, the park, so if you want to drive to an event, when you go on the website, the team's website, <clears throat> excuse me, the transportation section will show, you know, everyone encourage everyone that there, tell everyone that there is no parking on site or, or near this facility. And that if you want to drive to an event, you're actually driving to a satellite parking facility that will then be shuttled into the area. So this is showing, this map is showing just catchment areas, as we call them, of places where we know or expect that there'll be demand for parking facilities. So, you know, number one in the lower right there is people coming up to and from 93 south uh, to the south of the city, number four, 93, you know, north of the city. Um, and then number two is really just, you can't see it on this map, but just inside the the 128 loop um, and for people west and, and northwest of the city. So they would drive, they would buy their tickets, they would get their parking passes with that. They'll have to pre pre uh, determine which facility they're using so that we know how many people are gonna be parking at each facility. And that will uh, help us determine how many buses we need to service that facility for each game. So this will all be, again, in the messaging in from the beginning of you're not parking on site. We'll get into you're not parking around the stadium or around Franklin Park. Um, so if you're driving, this is your option. Next slide, please. Um, so now as we move closer to the site uh, and the next slide will be the one that's really more pertinent to, to um, Jamaica Plain, but just so everyone gets familiar. Um, the blue lines on this graphic say on, on the right side, on the east along Columbia Road, that would be the blue line shows the shuttle from satellite parking. And then the red lines show connections to um, transit station. So, you know, to and from Fields Corner on the red line. Um, and then we, there was a, a comment in the chat. If you look on the lower left, we'll also be running a shuttle from Forest Hills. Um, and yes, the orange line goes there, but You'll see in a second, there's a better option for Orange Line users if they want to take a shuttle. But there's also the commuter rail if the timing works out and then a multitude of bus routes that go through Forest Hills. So people will be able to take a bus to Forest Hills and then switch to a shuttle that would bring them right into Franklin Park and, and drop them off near the stadium. Um, so this, you know, this is how we're going to you know, not just say, hey, you should take the tea, but really encourage people. We're making this as easy as possible. This is your best way to get to the stadium. 
if you aren't able to walk because of the hills between the Orange Line and and Franklin Park, you know, to get to and from you know Green Street and Stony Brook, we're giving the, we're going to provide shuttles so that you have another way to get there. And and you know, if that's a better option for people, and then they have that way to go. Um, next slide, please. So similar to the last graphic, the the blue um, shows the satellite parking and, and the the red, which you can really barely see on here because it would only be separate or distinct from the blue as it's circling through Jackson Square Station itself is the shuttle. And then the purple is where the two the two routes overlap. Um, and what we're showing based on our analysis is that there'd be 57 shuttle buses approximately coming in here. And that's over a two hour period. So approximately 30 buses an hour. Um, so that would be you know, one bus every every two minutes in between these 57 buses and the buses that we showed on the previous slide or shuttles on the previous slide. We'd be able to accommodate about 6500 um, spectators. So it's a very significant portion of, of the people that would be there. And again, the, the rest of it would be people walking and biking or choosing to walk from Stony Brook and, and Green Street. Um, and we have more slides and, and options on this in a moment, but um, next slide, please. So this is showing um, the traffic volumes along Walnut Avenue. So the gray bars, and hopefully this is big enough for everyone to see, the gray bars is, is basically the hourly traffic volume that is on Walnut Avenue. Um, during the course of the day. And you can see, you know, in the morning, it's, it's obviously high at seven and eight, and then it kind of drops down midday and then comes back three, four and, and 5 p.m. for the, the evening peak hour rush. And then if you look, you can see that there's 28 buses and, and 29 buses, the small green additions on top of the uh, of the, the gray bars. And that that's the 57 buses that were on the, the previous slide, right? So again, approximately one bus every two uh, two minutes. They then have a break, um, you know, during the event when, yeah, there'll probably be a shuttle or two leaving, you know, for people that want to leave early. Um, but, you know, for the most part, there won't be any activity for those two hours. And then again, the two hours start up again to get people <coughs> out of the stadium after the event occurs. And, you know, we're using a start time here of, of seven o'clock. Um, and it's not, it's not a definite, it's not always going to be seven, but this is just to give an example, right? We can move these green bars um, to different times of the day, the numbers still stay the same, right? Regardless of what time it is, it would just be what time is actually being impacted on, on the streets, on the neighboring streets. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a, a detail showing one, a little bit of a blow up of the actual route that would be taken um, by those shuttle trips, right? They'd be coming down Columbus Avenue and, and the BRT lanes, and then using Walnut Avenue and circling around the red arrows here are, are inaccurate, I'm just realizing now. So this would be a one-way flow counterclockwise, right? They would come in, make the, the left turn into Franklin Park, where the existing uh, driveway is, and then circle around uh, the north and the west of the, of, the, of the stadium, and then exit on what will, is now um, just a pedestrian and bicycle path that we would separate. If you look at the larger picture and, and engineered plan on the left, it's a 30 foot wide uh, paved area that's a, a, a walking and bike trail right now. And during events, we would separate that into a, a 12 foot bus lane and 18 feet for people to walk and bike. And we would do that with barriers. And then at the actual entrance to Walnut Ave, which doesn't have a curb cut now, of course, because it's just for pedestrian and bicycles, we'll have to do some, some adjusting there. And they would come out um, at Walnut Avenue. And we'll, we'll get into, um, traffic operations more in, in a bit, but we will have a traffic management officer here um, at this intersection of School Street. There's going to be a high volume of pedestrians walking to and from the Orange Line. The bus is coming out, right? There's a lot of activity here that would be managed during uh, game day events. Next slide, please. So as part of uh, some previous meetings, we've had people uh, from, you know, Jamaica Plain specifically uh, in the Parkside neighborhood said, you know, is there a way that we can not use Walnut Ave um, to, for all these shuttles? You know, it's a it's a, uh, a smaller road, I would say, than Seaver Street. It's it's not all really narrow, but it's more residential in, in character, obviously, than, than Seaver Street is. So what this graphic is showing and, and the times on the left is showing is that it's approximately, if you're using the BRT lanes, about six or seven minutes to get from Jackson Square to the site. And you know, using Walnut Avenue as we're proposing. And if you had to drive around, it would be 12 to 14 minutes, right? So that leg of this trip 
would be twice as long. And when we're trying to encourage people to take the tea, an inefficiency like that really wouldn't be perceived well, right? And it would just give people a reason to say, well, I don't want to take the tea and then take the shuttle. It, it takes this crazy loop all the way around and drops me off further from the stadium. Like this isn't ideal anymore. I'm going to find a different way. So we don't really think that's viable for the Jackson Square shuttles. Now, with that said, you know, again, depending on exactly where our satellite parking uh, facilities are, the route to get to the stadium might actually be better off going, you know, uh, near Forest Hills and coming up Arbor Way and, and into the site from Circuit Drive. So the 57 buses that we were showing were both from Jackson Square and also a portion were from um, the satellite parking facility. So there's a chance that some of those buses would not be on Walnut Avenue. And, you know, as we keep fine tuning this and then start to determine what exact parking facilities we're using, we'll be able to to figure out what the best routes are to get the shuttles there as efficiently as possible. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as I mentioned at Walnut and School Street, we'll have a traffic operations manager directing traffic there um, due to all the pedestrians and, and, the, and the shuttle bus activity that, that we expect. We would also have one at Seaver Street in Columbus and Walnut Avenue, and this would purely be for traffic operations to try to get it to operate as efficiently as possible, understanding that, you know, sometimes the operations along there aren't all that efficient as it is during peak hours right now, but a traffic uh, operator there would really make things work, you know, probably better than they do on a, on a typical night right now. Um, we'd also have one at the, at the entrance to Franklin Park. This would be to facilitate uh, along Walnut Ave. This would be to facilitate the left turn for the buses, but then also as importantly to keep private vehicles out of the park. Right, they they're not allowed right now. You in, during non-events, there's a little small parking area there that vehicles are allowed to use, but it doesn't connect anywhere else in the park. And and this loop that we're showing is is meant for shuttles, so not used for pickup and drop off of, of private um, passengers. Um, and then on the right, you can see the South Loop, which again, you know, kind of impacts Dorchester more, but then also from Forest Hills, there'd be a loop there for pickup and drop off operations for the people on, on shuttles. Go ahead, next slide. Um, and then again, we're not encouraging the use of um, ride share, but we know it's gonna happen and where, we, and where we're gonna direct everyone to go through as you can see, the variable message signs and again on the website and even changing the address of White Stadium so that it's along Seaver Street so that when you put it in a GPS app, it brings you to this this point. Um, this is at the intersection of Humboldt Avenue and Seaver Street. Um, we would be providing a, 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 a ride share pickup and drop off area. Um, we're going to slightly modify it so that the right now there's actually a, a two entrance or one entrance and one exit and that forces right turns in and right turns out. And by modifying it to, to one driveway, we'd be able to get full access. This is showing vehicles traveling across the Humboldt Avenue, but they would also be able to make a left in and out along Seaver Street. Um, and then from here, it's a walk down a nice path within Franklin Park, but there would also be um, a golf cart to take anyone who has any ADA, any ADA issues and needs help to get to the stadium itself from this drop-off point. And then another key part, um on this is you know and actually you can go to the next slide i think it's yeah even better so we have this plan in place we're taking feedback from everyone as part of this process we're modifying that plan when the time comes we will have a plan um to go into that first game and but we don't expect it to be perfect and it's the, you know the, the variable message signs are a great way to to use people to direct them where we want them to go. And that's our first level, essentially, where we're starting, right? We're gonna tell people where to go. We're gonna message the best way to do things. Um, if we find that that's not working in any capacity for any part of this, whether it's the pick up and drop off or parking restrictions or, or whatever, we're gonna be able to modify that plan and we will modify that plan on a game to game basis, right? So if things don't work the way we expect for whatever reason for the first game, we'll make, ch we'll make changes. and. One of those examples in this case is, you know, right now we're we're directing people for pick up and drop off to, to use that Seaver Street area. But if people, we find too many people or, or people are not listening and, and using Walnut Street and kind of just picking up and dropping off as they see fit, well, then the next level is we can change those signs and say that there is no access to Walnut Avenue. 
Um, and then the third level, if, if things still aren't working, and these are just examples, right? But just examples of how we can change the plan as we go based on what we're seeing. The third level would be physically barricading Walnut Ave so that it's completely protected and, and you can't use it during those two hours before and two hours after. Obviously, this would be probably the most effective, but it would also then have impact to the residents, right, and everyone on this call. So we don't want to jump right to something that that we don't feel is necessary, right? We think with the messaging and the traffic uh, operations managers that people will, for the most part, follow what will be their best and most efficient way in and out of the stadium. And I will hand this off to Commissioner Grove to talk about um, the on street parking or for the streets surrounding the, the park. Good evening. All right. We're going to talk about how we're proposing to preserve uh, neighborhood parking and mobility. So B PD, uh, BTD is proposing to create a neighborhood specific game day parking program for residents and their visitors on streets within the identified white stadium walk area. These plans will be tailored to the needs of each neighborhood. Um, the program will allow residents with a uh, Jamaica Plain resident permit parking sticker on their vehicle to park on streets where parking is prohibited on game days. Additionally, we're proposing uh, a visitor placard uh, or hang tag program that will be available to residents regardless of vehicle ownership, so long as they live on a street in the white stadium walk shed. We're, we're thinking that this is probably one visitor permit per household issued annually. We would likely change colors um, to help with enforcement. We've also um, explored the option of a, a digital um, uh, option in the future. From an enforcement um, perspective, we would, um, well, first, uh, Boston Unity Soccer is proposing to hire um, a senior operations manager who will engage with community members for feedback and coordination on all the operational concerns that uh, Brian has mentioned previously. What BTD is proposing is a new uh, event fee violation. Um, it would be a $100 fine for parking violations on game days in the designated areas. Uh, there's a sign, there's a visual on the, on the slide here, which is a sample sign that we use up and around Boston College for BC uh, football games. That's been a very effective program up there. Uh, those signs read toe zone, no stopping on game days. However, what we're proposing here is that um, residents would be exempt if they had an RPP sticker, uh, as well as their visitors uh, with, with that uh, sticker or placard program that we mentioned. Um, those regulations would be in effect four hours before a game and one hour after. I do want to pause here for one second and just explain that what we're proposing here is not an expansion of RPP at this time. Um, this would just be uh, a game day parking restriction. We would utilize the existing RPP program uh, to allow residents to obtain a sticker so that they would um, be exempt from that. But I also, in some of the business areas, um, this prohibition, this regulation wouldn't necessarily trump uh, existing um, regulations. So for example, uh, HP DB parking, if there is two hour parking in place, um, if there's um, no stopping areas, we're not saying that that would necessarily um, change here. But that is the type of thing that we're going to want feedback on. Um, we would enforce all of this through a dedicated parking enforcement shift that would be assigned on game days to that time period before, during, and after games. And towing would be activated to support that enforcement. Um, for for non-soccer park visitors, um, and you know this has been made clear before, but uh, soccer game attendees will not be allowed to park uh, in the Franklin Park lots. Um, we're committed to retaining parking for the uh, key destinations such as the zoo, the golf course, the Shattuck picnic area, tennis courts. Uh, the park rangers um, and BPD will be the primary enforcement uh, vehicle for parking restrictions within the park. Um, and they'll be supported from game day traffic ambassadors, as Brian mentioned earlier. Uh, all park visitors can also access the free Boston Muni shuttles from uh, the MBTA station as well on game days. 
We're going to continue to work closely um, with the Franklin Park stakeholders, such as the zoo and golf course, to craft operational plans um, specific to the needs of their visitors. Um, and you know, uh, Boston Parks will be will be involved in that process. So this is the uh, walk shed area, the area you see, uh, walk area that you see shaded in orange, um, where uh, again, we wouldn't be proposing to expand RPP, but uh, individuals who had an RPP sticker would be exempt as well as their visitors, as we mentioned. Um, this radius is based on you know, what we believe is what people would be willing to walk, uh, park and walk. We really, really want um, feedback on this. Um, and if we go to the next slide. Um, oh. oh, sorry, Commissioner. So we just wanted to give people a heads up of what the number is for Slido. You're sure. about to see a more detailed street plan, but just so everyone knows, we'll put it in the chat as well. You can scan the QR code or, or go to the site and type that number. Hand it back to you. Great. So here's just a map with kind of the street by street. And what we will also drop into the chat uh, is a Google sheet. So um, you can look up um, your street um, just in an alpha list to, to see if it's there, just to make it a little bit easier. But um, we really want we really want feedback on this. Um, are these the right streets? Um, are there streets that either you know should be in here, should not? Are there specific concerns about regulations on, for example, Washington Street? Uh, these are these are the things that we really want to hear from you on. Yes, I'll put the QR code back here. Awesome, thank you for the responses here. What we'll, we'll have note of this. So I see some new Spring Park Ave, Montebello Road. Um, um, yes, keep them coming in. So we'll, um, I don't know, Brian, if you wanna address any of these that are coming up, but we will um, take note of these and and, and uh, make sure that yeah. we, we consider them. I think everyone I've seen so far is within that area, um, but that's why this is great because now we have a, um, a record of it and we will make sure to take a look and someone made a comment about blue hill ave being the eastern boundary and we just had that discussion with dorchester residents right so this is what we're proposing now and based on the feedback that we're getting from you and and the other neighbors and the other residents you know we can expand it contract it you know ever how you know how we receive the feedback um thank you for also sharing streets that where you do not want it extended so i see here someone um, mentions Center Street, Dalrymple Street. So we'll, this will give us a way to pressure test the current streets there. Sylvia Street, awesome. Okay, thank you. So, so I see, yeah, we'll, we'll be posting the, the slides after um, tonight's meeting. We've had three back to back, so we'll get it up as soon as we can. So you'll be able to look at it more closely and see if it was on there or not. Alrighty, this will remain open, so we'll leave it in the chat, and you can keep sending in your suggestions here. Okay, um, so so keep sending in your feedback. Um, I'm going to talk through what this would look like for um, two uh, local residents in a moment, uh, but just to reiterate um, what you all just heard, so we shared an overview of the project, then we talked about what our transportation approaches. Um, and then we shared what the multimodal routes would be and um, what support we're including to, to encourage um, uh, visitors for all the, the magnet destinations at Franklin Park to be able to continue to come uh, for game day visitors, um, local residents and BPS students. So what we wanna um, iterate 
reiterate here is that during a game day, we have not finalized the schedule yet. So we are able to think through how to do a schedule that fits multiple events in a day. So you might see a local running group run the stairs at the stadium early in the morning, um, then a farmer's market in the early morning to the early afternoon. Uh, then in the later afternoon, event parking restrictions would take place and begin about four hours before the game. Then you have the two hour match and an hour later, uh, the parking restrictions would be lifted. So um, here are two uh, local residents uh, based on what we've heard from meeting with you all. Um, and we are setting the scene where there's a game at 6 p.m. on a Sunday. So here we have Veronica, who's um, 75 years old and uh, lives on Ifley Road in JP. Um, so uh, Veronica is actually not going to a game, but um, let's go through her day. At 10 a.m., she'll see game day parking passes on cars parked on Ifley Road. Um, she won't notice any event-related impacts um, as the game hasn't started um, yet. Then at 6 p.m., she decides, I want to do some grocery shopping at uh, the Stop and Shop on Center Street by Jackson Square. Um, she will notice traffic detail at School Street, um, some traffic on Warren Street and Columbus Ave as we see currently. Um, and then she finishes her shopping and at 7 p.m. she drives home to Ifley Road um, and she'll notice again some traffic on Columbus Ave and Washington Street. Uh, but she has her game day parking pass um, and can go back home safely and, and, and park um, on her street. Then we have another scenario where we have Rachel, who's 15, um, and during the day, she decides she's going to walk her brother to El Parquecito playground. Um, and again, at this time, there are no event related impacts. Um, you might see some runners or some um, BPS teams there or, uh, you know, just people walking around um, the, the stadium at that time. And then at 8 p.m., she decides to walk her dog. Um, so she will also see traffic detail at School Street and Walnut Ave and will notice uh, fans leaving the stadium, but should be able to uh, walk her dog as she normally would. So um, from here, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Chief Irish to talk through what you can expect for some next steps and uh, before we dive into the Q&A. Thanks, Angie. As has been mentioned many times, your feedback is important. So I really appreciate all the engagement I see already going on in, in the chat. Uh, we'll incorporate your feedback into the plan. The plan will be presented at the May 15th IAG meeting. The Boston Unity soccer team will present the final plan to the BPDA board for approval. And then the Boston Transportation Department will then codify the TMP, the Transportation Access Plan Agreement with Boston Unity. Um, as Brian mentioned, this is an operational plan that will continue to evolve and be refined based on experience. And, and this work will also give us a blueprint to implement for other large events at the stadium. BPS transportation team is also working with BPS students and we we have a we'll have upcoming conversations about the smaller events as well, but tonight it's focused on the um the bigger event. So at this point, we want to open up for some conversation um, beyond what's already going on in the chat. Um, but before we open it up to um, folks who have their hands raised, I would like to give our elected um, officials who are with us an opportunity to say hello, um, beginning with Representative Montana. Hey, sorry, I was playing the unmute mute game. Um, I just want to say thank you to the city for this presentation. Um, I understand it's still very much a work in progress and there's a lot of details to figure out. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to engage. And it, you know, I think that this will be an ever evolving conversation. So we're looking forward to you all coming back and presenting uh, the incorporated information, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Absolutely, this is a work in progress. Um, now, Councillor Weber. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, thanks for um, allowing me to speak. Um, I, you know, I think I've, I'm impressed with the turnout uh, for for this neighborhood meeting, um, and you know, I think that there is work that we still need to do. Um, I. Uh, I just, I don't know, uh, uh, Dion, we can talk about this at some point. I, I was 
I, I think the I the uh, IAG was assembled in uh, the January second or third. I, I I wasn't asked for uh, a nominee. I uh, just uh, I don't know what the usual process is, um, but um, I, I don't think the District Six Counselor has uh, put someone on the IAG. So I just maybe someone could reach out to me about that, explain the rules, uh, but. Uh, you know, I'm I'm interested to hear what folks have to say. I see Peter Dakota says his hand up, uh, and, and nice to see him again. But um, you know, uh, again, I I you know I'm here. I'm happy to hear from anyone in the neighborhood. Uh, I you know I also think it might be a good idea for folks from the city and from Boston Unity to meet with some of the abutter neighborhood uh, organizations like Parkside and Stony Brook and. Um, uh, to to get their feedback, you know, uh, yeah, I think it would be helpful uh, just to you know meet with them in person. They they live a few feet from the park and talk to them. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor. We'll we'll connect with you further, and we're definitely happy to meet with groups, and we've been meeting with groups, and happy to continue to do that. Um, we're going to now turn it over to uh, members of the public, and starting with um, Peter Dakotas. Hi, thanks everybody. Uh, I appreciate you taking you all taking the time to uh, come and meet with all of our groups. And Councillor Weber, thank you so much for attending as well. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, Morgan has been great with communication as well. And uh, I personally um, would love to see White Stadium renovation happen. Um, and I have a few concerns. I think that um, the, the transportation being the biggest one. And I know that this sort of overlaps with a lot of other initiatives that are going on in Jamaica Plain specifically, um, and I'm sure Roxbury and Dorchester and Mattapan as well. Um, I'm part of the JP Neighborhood Council and also the Eggleston Square Neighborhood Association. Uh, we just had a, a great presentation from uh, William Moose as well uh, about the speed humps and all of that. And um, it's we're going to lose a fair amount of parking on School Street. It sounds like now on Walnut. And I, I know that, you know, with climate change, it's it's a big issue. It's a big deal. And we want to try to mitigate a lot of concerns with car pollution, and I'm all for that. But a lot of people have cars in the neighborhood and still need to park. And I would like to see more addressed in terms of making up for the parking we will be losing um, in certain locations. There's some spots up available on Walnut that I um, talked to uh, William Moose about before. Uh, there are creative ways to solve the issue. Um, and, and I think with resident parking, so there's a couple of things and I'll go quickly. Um, I think we could outline, I don't know how do you call it, what you call this, but outline parking spots with paint to define the parking spot so that people aren't parking in weird places and there's a 10 foot gap between cars. Um, I mentioned adding more spaces to account for the ones you're going to take away. Um, I think there there would be the opportunity that that lot that you just showed on Seaver Street for um, the ride. You might be able to accommodate shuttles there as well to move them around. Um, the fines, I think, are not quite enough, quite what they need to be. Um, to discourage people from parking there. And uh, I would love to hear just in closing what the big objection to resident parking, permanent resident parking is. Thank you. So Thanks. before we get into that larger discussion, let me just address the Seaver Street lot, um, you know, being used for ride share. There's also a bus stop right on Seaver Street right next to it. And the issue with using that, or even this has been in the chat a bit, um, using that or even the, the last station that's on the BRT lanes on Columbus Ave is that the shuttles don't have a way to turn around, even as wide as um, 
Seaver Street is. The four lanes is not any the four lanes and the bike lane, it's still not wide enough to for the, the a bus to essentially do a U-turn. So if we were going to use any of that along Seaver Street, we would actually mean setting the buses all the way down to, to the east into Dorchester and other places for them to be able to turn around to get back to Jackson Square. So um, you know, we're not purposely and in, intentionally impacting Walnut Ave because it, it is a residential street, but it is the most efficient way to, to move people in and out of here for people going to Jackson Square. On the uh, RPP issue, you know, um, we are proposing to restart that program uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, and, and like uh, in Brighton today, um, you know, those signs could work in tandem with an RPP program. All right, thanks. Um, now we'll have um, Abby Holt. Oh, and, and by the way, I just wanted to point out, we do have a meeting scheduled with Stony Brook um, Neighborhood Association. Abby? Hi, yeah, um, I'm Abby Holt. I live on Burnett Street in District 6, and I'm on the IAG. Um, I'm very excited about this whole proposal. Uh, honestly, like, when I moved here, the place across the street for me was an empty warehouse and there was parking all down the street, but that went away and now parking is harder, but I have an amazing bakery right near my house that I can walk to shout out third cliff. So yes, I, I know that it's going to impact my parking. I'm deeply excited to be able to walk or bike to a soccer team that I, I mean, I've been following the NWSL now through COVID and it's been a true joy and it kind of got me through and I thought when this team was coming in, it was gonna be somewhere out in the suburbs and that it wouldn't care about the city and the people in it. And I am pumped to see that that is not true, that it is interested in coming here and that it genuinely seems to be trying to bed itself into the community. And I hope that it continues to. I think it's very important that it continue to listen. Um, I really hope that it would have like some sort of advisory council and I'd love to see BPS students on that. Um, I'm so excited that there's this public private partnership. I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, things done for those students. They deserve it. Um, but yeah, I didn't move here for the parking. It's a city. I moved here to be able to walk to a soccer game. So I'm pumped. So that was what I had to say. <clears throat> Thanks, Abby. Um, does anyone want to respond? Okay. Just we'll thank you, on. Abby. Okay. That was great. Thanks. Um, Anne McKinnon. Okay, um, real quick. Um, I, there wasn't an adequate discussion of the timeline. Um, it just says you're going to the board for approval. When is that going to be? Um, second, I asked four times for some information on the scope for the DPIR. My city councilor, Ben Weber, had to get that answer for me. I shouldn't have to send four emails to try to get a basic piece of information. Now I understand that there is not planned a DPIR, that all that is being requested is, quote, supplemental information. This seems count, uh, counter to what Mayor Wu recently said, which was, we need more community engagement on this project. Just submitting uh, a hurried, small revision to the existing uh, project notification form um, doesn't seem to fit that bill. Second, uh, there was discussion of um, th this project catalyzing some of the other projects in the Franklin Park Mass uh, Action Plan. Um, and that fits into my concern about the failure to accommodate, to account for the cumulative impacts of other events. There were some development projects that were included in the analysis, but the biggest cumulative impact, which is required by section 80B-3A of article 80, requires that cumulative impacts of all existing and planned projects be included. The biggest one that was omitted was what is going to happen on this by the city's programming on the Grove. This must be included. You are planning to bring in lots of new festivals. There's uh, images of all kinds of 
um, people gathering there, that must be included in the DPIR, which I also think is, is required. Finally, blue bikes, you've, you've accommodated them at the stadium, but you haven't said how are you going to guarantee that they're going to be available at the origin. Available for what? And sorry. I think and what, was, what was that on the blue bikes? The blue bikes, um, you, you said how you're going to have parking for a thousand, but you didn't address how you're going to make sure that they're available at Forest Hills, Green, uh, Jackson Square, and all of the, the origins. For oh, the origins. Um, it, I mean, people are going to be coming from all different parts of the city, right? So it's not going to be, if they're getting on at Forest Hills, I would expect most people would get on the shuttle and, and not, not bike from there. So the origin or the destination after the game will have less of a concentration at any one specific location. And is there any other transportation portion of the question that uh, the team would like to respond to? Okay, great. So just a reminder again that we, we have a two minute limit on questions and we wanna keep it on transportation for tonight. And we'll just take a note of anything that's non-transportation, but the focus tonight is transportation. Um, Cleo Woodcock. Hi, um, my name is Cleo. Um, I'm an Upper Montebello Road uh, resident, uh, lifelong JP resident, and also a uh, BPS soccer coach, and also daily park dog walker. Um, so my question is really um, about transportation plans um, during the construction phase, um, and like kind of starting now up until uh, the stadium is operational for the NWSL and improved uh, BPS uses. I'm also very excited about this project. I think it's an amazing idea. Um, but my question is now, um, I swear I'm almost hit by a car like once a week in a crosswalk trying to get to the park. And um, with the spring sports season starting, there are a lot of student athletes in the neighborhood and um, I also have neighbors with children and dogs and such. And I'm wondering what the kind of proposed safety measures once construction starts and they're bigger and more vehicles in the area, like how that's gonna work um, for pedestrian and bike safety. I think that's a great question. Um, however, I don't know if there's any part of it that the transportation folks want to touch, but I do know that as we get further towards like construction, then we can really have a more um, in-depth conversation around transportation planning relative to construction. But tonight's meeting is really focused on a different type of transportation planning, uh, which I think we're trying to keep the focus on. So anything to add, Brian or Nick? Yeah, I mean, I would just say for pedestrian safety, I mean, along Walnut Ave and at the other park entrances, I mean, having traffic operations people there is really, you know, it's even better than a signal, right? We're going to have people directing traffic, and quite honestly, there's going to be so many pedestrians, similar to, you know, when you leave an event at the garden, right, that they're going to take priority just because they're going to be the volume of people that are in, in the area. So, you know, as you leave... Um, or coming to White Stadium or leaving White Stadium to cross Walnut Ave, you know, that it's, there's going to be people there to get you across safe, safely that doesn't exist. And then I'll put on William's hat for a second, you know, having a raised intersection at Walnut and, and School Street as the city is planning, even for non-game days, would be a huge improvement for traffic calming and pedestrian safety, right? It, they really work well to, to make drivers slow down and to acknowledge pedestrians more than they do on their own in this region, unfortunately. Yeah, so just to put a final point on that. So there, right now we're discussing transportation plan for the operation. However, for construction, there will also need to be a transportation plan approved yeah. by the transportation department. Sorry, yes, so, and sorry, I meant to go into that. So as part of any large development that goes through Article 80 the way we are, um, you need to have a construction management plan and that is reviewed by and approved by BTD. And that includes um, truck routes and, and different things like that. Obviously, in this case, it's going to have a very significant and unique aspect of it, of being reviewed by the Parks Department as well and saying where our trucks can go within Franklin Park. So we are not at that level of detail, right? It would be kind of a little presumptuous in 
ahead of putting the cart before uh, the cart before the horse for us to be doing something on on construction like that when we're not even through permitting yet. Thanks, um, Lori DeSantis. Hi, um, I am running a short term rental um, for eight years. My house is set up as a real bed and breakfast. I have three listings in my home where I live and I take really good care of my home. I'm on the corner of Copley and Atherton and I'm really concerned about this parking restriction because I would say at least 50% of the people who stay at my place, they literally write to me and say, do you have parking? And if I say no, they're not going to come. This is my only income and I'm very concerned how this is going to work. Am I going to go out of business? Am I going to have to move? I mean, I'm really scared about this. And I have a question. Is this already a done deal? I thought we were still voting on whether or not we even accept this proposal. I thought there was still an, an option on the table to just have the city renovate White Stadium for the Boston Public School kids, which is what I would vote for. And then my final point was have you considered having the MBTA loan their bus yard gigantic parking lot for game days down on Washington Street? Instead of having all these buses driving around and causing all these fumes, what about just creating a specific lot for the big events? I don't know, it's just an idea, but I'm wondering if you've thought of any of these things. Thank you. Any responses to the transportation components of the question? Yeah, I'll take the parking lot. I mean, anytime you create a parking lot for private vehicles, you're going to create more traffic, right? We can fit 50 people on a bus. We can fit, what, maybe six or seven at most in a in a car. So, you know, the lot seems like you, you, you won't have the buses making or the cars making the, the loops the way you will with buses, but the sheer volume of it would be much more impactful, whether it's traffic or environmental than than, than the plan that we have for, for shuttles only. Okay, thanks. And the other parts of your question will, will be noted in um, sort of follow up. Um, Michael Epp. Uh, yes, a couple things on transportation. Uh, for as we have said, that 4,000 people are supposed to go uh, by shuttle bus at uh, 60 people per bus. That's 60 buses. At 50 feet per center on a bus, that's a queue that's 3,030 feet long. That's about a half mile. Um, and uh, if you're waiting for that bus at the end of the game, at 4,000 uh, people times three feet per square foot, which is a theater loading by code, that's about a quarter of an acre. None of the site plans show anything that shows a loading zone that approximates that number of buses or that many people waiting. Uh, the other thing, uh, this is an Olmstead landscape. It's a world heritage site. Um, we should not be drawing a mustache on the Mona Lisa. The history of the White Stadium is a history of racism in Boston, uh, starting with Curley. I don't think we should continue that history of racism. And the uh, this is about right. redlining. If if right, a, thank, thank you, Mike. Let's we want to take the um, the transportation component of your question and give others the chance to ask. The question as well. Um, yeah, I, I, well. There was a lot of numbers there. Um, I just, you know, our numbers show, like I said, there's about 130 shuttles, whether it's from the Walnut Ave, the North Loop, as we call it, or the South Loop from Forest Hills and from Blue Hill Avenue. And with 125 buses and 50 passengers per bus, that's 6,200 people. So, I mean, those are the numbers. Um, it's more than 4,000. I, I don't know where that came from. And the other very important part is even after the end of the game, not the intent is to not have everyone leaving right away. Now, obviously, before the game, there'll be much more spread out. There'll be events in the Grove, and that's very easy to understand. But even after the game, the intent is to have um, some sort of activities afterwards to spread out the amount of people that are looking to leave all at the exact same time. So, again, you know, we're we're providing these shuttles, and and the numbers we're using are based on what we expect. We could end up meeting 150 
shuttles and you know eight thousand people whatever the numbers are we'll, we'll get there and that's how we'll what we were talking about before about modifying the plan as we go um but it's not a surge of everyone leaving at once and it's you know you can do the math it's 50 people times whatever number of bus you want to put in will give you the number of spectators that we can accommodate thanks and we have about 10 minutes left so susan sibolsky Yeah, thanks. Um, just a couple of brief comments. <clears throat> I really like this project. I, I strongly support it. And um, I'm really grateful for the improvements, uh, the improved facilities that the, our Boston public school kids will will get out of it. Um, I mean, the, the, the condition of that stadium and the track um, right now is just shameful. Um, and I'm also excited to uh, to watch the soccer team and cheer them on. I, you know, we're also going to get some additional community benefits, some that I hadn't even thought of until you had this these, this transportation meeting uh, tonight about the, you know, about a really a hard a close look at some of this, you know, a lot of safety issues around uh, around this area and and some additional traffic calming. Um, that maybe we wouldn't have gotten or we wouldn't we wouldn't be getting so soon if it weren't for this project. Um, I, I appreciate you having these meetings. I also don't expect that you have all of the answers to 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 the question to, to you know to all of the questions and everything ironed out yet. There's uh, there's still time, and I appreciate all of the all of the uh, you know my neighbors participating in this meeting tonight because it seems like there's. A lot of there were a lot of good comments and questions, and the city, your the uh, your folks from the city have been doing a really, uh, 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 you've been really fast and 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 uh, thorough. It seems like addressing the comment, uh, addressing those uh, comments and questions in the chat. So I just want to thank everybody, and I look forward to. I I, I expect that we'll have more of these meetings, um, and and we'll just continue to make progress and and make you know come up with improved plans. Um, so thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Th thank you. Um, Dorothy Fennell. Hi, team. Uh, I want to echo the, the former person speaking. Um, it looks like we lost her. Chief, um, hmm? getting back in, I just wanted to note that we're getting a lot of questions in the chat about um, accessibility. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we have a moment to address those. Brian, would you be able to talk through the accessibility plan? You're muted, Brian, I'll ask you to unmute. Yeah, I did. I actually just saw one of those comments from, from Jackie um, and did a very quick response, but right. So since there is no public parking on site, there is no ADA parking on site as well, um, but there the the north loop drop off that we're talking about that would use walnut ave there is an accessible path you know that's right next to the stadium so there's an accessible path to get from the shuttles to to the stadium entrance um and then the ride share over on Seaver street and the south loop which is off of circuit drive those both have paths that aren't entirely ada accept, accessible and it's not because of the condition it's because of the topography and you know going up and over hills and, and the slopes so we will be providing ADA services from those two locations via golf cart to get people with access needs from those pick up and drop off locations to the stadium, right? That's the, the parks department doesn't want us going in and flattening out walks and, and things like that, which, you know, for the preservation of the park. So, you know, instead of making the, the route ADA compliant, we're going to provide ADA service through, through the golf carts. Excellent. Thanks, Morgan, for making sure it'd be equitable to folks in the chat. Anything else in the chat before? Um, I think that was the big. Um, I think the other big theme that I saw earlier was um, a lot of questions about the proposed shuttle route on Walnut and why can't we use um, MBTA bus stops rather than the turnaround that we're proposing. Um, Brian, do you maybe want to address that point as well? Yeah. Yeah, so there is a, a station, you know, right at, at Seaver and, and Columbus and, and Walnut, but, um, and, and this is in the chat, some people have seen it, there isn't a way to turn the buses around, and I think I've said it, sorry, I don't know if it was just in the chat, um, or if I said it verbally, but there's not a way to to turn the, the buses around, even if they use that station, so um, 
you know, we still need to get them or, or get the buses to turn around. And also, again, we're trying to encourage people to use these shuttles and dropping them off outside of the park and, and away from the station stadium is not, you know, the most encouraging or efficient way to, to get people to the stadium. All right, thanks. So I'm going to try to get to the folks with raised hands. And if you could just um, ask you a question in a minute, that'd be great. Uh, we'll start with Dorothy since we, we lost you when you last spoke. You lost me because it was my fault because my phone died. But I wanted to say, one, the team, you guys have done a great job uh, in listening to folks' comments because these plans were nowhere near where they are now. So thank you for the opportunity to have a discussion. Uh, I also want to know, uh, for Will, one is safety surge starting because my concern is about, I know it's operations, but construction, I'm worried about all these trucks coming through. Are we going to have speed humps before we start construction? And have to redo it because of all the weight on them from the vehicles, but there's that. And then the last thing is I think Ann McKinnon was right. We should really be thinking about the, the connectivity um, for places like Forest Hills. Um, I mean, this is all part of the trip. And I think there's a higher transfer uh tax if you can call it that when you put somebody on a um public transit to a shuttle that shuttle is still going to be stuck in traffic but if you can get people as many as you can on blue bikes uh and then drop blue bikes at key locations beforehand they're just going to do the rebalancing for you they're just going to be loading up that queue of electric blue bikes that you're going to need to get them out of there at the end. So um, good job. Thank you. And um, looking forward to more conversations. Dorothy, you just, I just brought up a good point. I have to talk to the blue bikes people about how they accommodate um, elect the new electric bikes when they're doing valet, right? Because the dock is what's charging them. So um, I will talk to them and figure that out. Thanks. Okay, um, moving on to Matt Sly. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks. Um, I'm Matt. I'm, I've lived in Jamaica Plain for about 15 years, um, and I have two uh, soccer-playing daughters, and our whole family is very excited about this project and look forward to, you know, walking to the uh, to the park and, and seeing some world-class athletes play. Um, I actually, I, I, I was late tonight because, in fact, I was running a sixth-grade girls' soccer practice, so I missed the first 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but, and, and many of my kids are also excited about this. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, the transportation piece is obviously very challenging. Um, and, I, and I think it's challenging in a good way because personally, I'm, you know, I would rather this approach versus driving 40 minutes into the suburbs and, and, and you know, parking in a huge parking lot. Um, but I'm curious about, uh, you know, how you're going about uh, looking at case studies, you know, in particular, I'm thinking of um, Boston College with their football games um, and even Fenway Park, right, which is in an urban place and then in other other stadiums and other cities and, and, and basically how you're you're working to sort of simulate what the impact of, you know, what I think are, are really um, innovative strategies, right, with public transportation, with the biking. But of course, it's also somewhat speculative because it's because it is so different. Um, so I'm just, I'm curious to hear more about like how, how are you going to kind of flesh out and validate, um, the approach, you know, looking at what's already been done, um, you know, in, in other venues with, with similar types, types of crowds. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. And I should also mention, I'm also excited about this because my, my kids play soccer and my, uh, my daughter is plays for Boston Public Schools and, and this fall played for, uh, you mentioned that she thought the pitch was the most dangerous field she's ever played on at, at White Stadium. And I, it would be great to see uh, her play on a, a great new pitch in a couple of years. Um, thanks, Matt. I know Commissioner Gove did cover this early on. I don't know if you want to just say something quickly, and but I, I think we'll also be sharing the slides with Commissioner. Sure, we, we are. <clears throat> planning to use some of the strategies that we've implemented in and around Fenway Park and um, up at Boston College. So, for example, um, up around BC, we're proposing to utilize uh, similar type signs that we use up there. So uh, no stopping tow zone signs four hours before a game, um, an hour after. That would be in the in the walk area around White Stadium. And then uh, similarly, the from a violation standpoint, creating a violation that's similar to what we did around Fenway Park. There's a $100 um, uh, violation specific to that area where we're proposing something similar for White Stadium. Thanks. Now we'll try to get to the three additional hands and then um, we'll wrap. Um, Beth Abelo.
You're muted. Okay. Hi. Um, Beth Abelow, I'm 20 plus year Jamaica Plain resident, and uh, I live on Rocky Nook Terrace. Um, so I'm pretty much direct to butter to the park. Um, I, you know, this is good. We're fleshing out the details, but really like transportation is probably the highest concern, the transportation plan. And um, to everyone. So uh, one, one question I have is, you know, you're saying not everybody's going to be leaving at the same time, but if people are having to take shuttles to get to their parking lot and it's only a limited time, you know, anytime, I mean, I leave Fenway, people leave. And especially if they're going to go, you know, they have to take further transportation to get to where their car is. My other point, aside from my con direct concerns about the transportation around the park, is that, um, you know, with the wide zone of restricted parking, resident parking, going all the way up almost to Center Street, that's going to have a negative impact on businesses around the area because lots of people come to Jamaica Plain from outside to utilize our businesses and things. So I'm I'm concerned about that as well from that parking perspective. I know, you know, there's always a trade-off with different things, but I think that's, you know, something we should be thinking about as well. Yeah, so we have um, on that detail plan that we showed uh, for the uh, for the parking restrictions, there were areas, like you said, specifically along uh, Washington Street near Eggleston, where there was a concentration of, of short term parking. Um, and they are all signed for or, and if they're not signed, our, our recommendation within discussions with the city is to sign them for two hour parking um, this way. They're still there for commercial use, but they would have to turn over in a shorter duration than someone that's visiting and going to the game would be able to use it. Um, and, you know, Commissioner Grove could, go, could probably talk to it more, but this is similar to his areas near Fenway, right, where there's where there's durations like that placed in um, on, the, on the parking spaces so that when there's not Fenway events, there is still commercial parking for, for people to use. But you can't use a two hour space and go to a soccer game or a baseball game because you're going to run out of time and, and end up getting a ticket anyway. Thanks, Brian. Um, C. Kaliga. Hi. Can you hear me? Because. All right. Yes. So. Yes, I am thrilled if there's a women's soccer team in Boston. I'm an immigrant's daughter, grew up playing soccer. My brother was a pro. My son has played travel at Parkway. He is on Hammer Club. He is a freshman at Tech Boston, came into school playing on the JV team immediately and comes off the bench for varsity. We are a soccer family. Guess what? We wouldn't have to have these convoluted complicated plans for I've been to all three meetings for parking for transportation for any of the dilemmas and problems and we would not lose green space in a park which services mostly communities of color and people a lot of people of lower income levels you are taking green space and you are trying to hurt the residents that live around there because that's what's going to happen with these parking plans. I don't care. I have not heard any good solutions. Nickerson Field might be turf. It will cost a hell of a lot less. It holds about 10,000 people right now. And it would cost a lot less if we converted it from turf. If you don't, you say turf doesn't work to grass. And that would solve everything. And we'd still have a women's soccer team in my beloved Boston where I was born. That's all I have to say, because these plans have not solved. These meetings have not showed me any solving of these parking or transportation dilemmas. They're just so complicated. Thanks. And I've given other people the liberty to talk for two minutes, and even though I didn't have a question. So um, we'll do the same here. And our last um, raised hand is Melissa Hamill.
Um, Melissa, you can. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm, I was having a hard time unmuting myself. Sorry. Um, you know, I, I've been listening to this all night. I've listened. I've come to every single meeting, and I feel like there's a lot of questions that are not being answered. A lot of concerns that are not being addressed. Um, we. Um, this is a, a very tight urban community, and I think this is going to negatively impact our our neighborhoods if this goes forward. Um, you haven't answered the question about um, parking permits. How will people have host friends over for for barbecues during the weekends when when there's a game going on? Let's say I have a few friends that want to come over. How are they going to park? I, I I have one permit. That's not going to be sufficient. Um, you didn't address Lori DeSantis's question about how she she will be impacted her business. I also run a business too, and this will impact me as well. Um, as well as, you know, just I feel like you haven't talked about the satellite parking. Where are those satellite parking locations going to be? A lot of things have been gone un unanswered. And I feel like this has been very disrespectful for the, to the community. Everybody wants White Stadium to be renovated. That's a no brainer. We want it to be the best for the school children. But partnering with this 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 way is just not I don't think it's fair for the communities. It's going to have a negative impact on our neighborhoods. And I would really hope that you would rethink this. Um, thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Now, I want to thank everyone you know, for indulging us and staying five minutes over. Um, I'm sorry, Lisa, we, we did say we're already over and Melissa was the, the last hand raised that we were going to take. So as, as we appreciate all the feedback that we've gotten from tonight. Really great questions in the chat and, and live. This will all inform you know, further iterations of this transportation plan. And we do know that transportation is an important issue to, to many of you. That's why you're here tonight. And that's why this is the end of um, three hours of us having transportation conversations. So uh, we you will hear further from us and we look forward to our next engagement opportunities. Um, can we show that slide? Uh, we stopped sharing, but I do want to let folks know that uh, there are some other opportunities where we can talk about things other than transportation that are also important. So I encourage you all to, to visit um, our White Stadium website or send us an email at whitestadium at boston.gov and join us at some other engagement opportunities so we can talk about other important, important topics related to this project. So thank you again for your time and wish everyone a good and safe night.